Magic 87.6, let's talk some tech with Matthew Dickerson. Hello. Yeah, let's talk some tech, absolutely. All right, let's get stuck into it uh, this week. There's uh, loads going on. Uh, Apple, the EU, there's a battle going on there, Matt. There is a battle going on. It's been going on for about 12 years. European Commission said about 12 years ago, every different phone manufacturer, every different company that makes a different electronic device goes and makes their own proprietary plug. And it's just crazy the amount of e-waste that was being created 12 years ago the European Commission was concerned about. No surprises here. That amount of e-waste has gone up as everyone buys a charger, then they don't need it for the next device they buy, they throw that out, they buy a new one. So basically they said to the industry, can you please just get some standard there? Just come up with some sort of standard and let's use that. And that makes sense. Micro USB was kind of that standard for a little while, but the industry finally got to the point where USB-C is essentially the standard. And so lots of things now have got USB-C. Mobile phones, Android mobile phones, various tablets are coming out, computers, even lights that I use on my bike. When I charge up those lights, they're USB-C. So everyone's yeah. come to the party. That's all fantastic, <gasps> except Apple. Because Apple say, if you make us use USB-C, you're stopping innovation. We need to be able to have our lightning adapter to keep going on, innovating in the wonderful way that we innovate. Now, don't worry about the fact that they actually do make their iPad Pro range, their yeah. iPad Air, their iPad Mini. They all have USB-C. Just ignore that for the moment. So pretend that's not happening. The basic iPad right. and the iPhone have got lightning ports. Even the new iPhone 13 that just came out has got a lightning port on it. And Apple says they're needed for innovation. What they're not saying to the European Commission, at least not publicly, is that, well, actually, we make a bit of commission out of every other product that's made around the world with yeah. lightning, so we can control that. We can make sure not only we make a bit of money out of it, but Apple's always like to be in control. They like to make sure that they control what's happening with their products. So by keeping lightning ports on their iPhones, in my opinion, they're just cont- retaining control over that. It may well be that the next iPhone that comes out next year has no lightning port, has no port on it whatsoever. It, they may actually prefer to have no port on it rather than go to USB-C. And meanwhile, the rest of the world's moved to USB-C, and that's wonderful because everyone can use that same standard. And you don't get stuck with all these different types of charging cables. 30 charging cables I did count at one stage there about, it was about 12 years ago, with all these different charging cables. So it's gone that way. European Commission is going to put their foot down. I'm not sure what's going to happen with Apple. They may get angry or they may toe the line. I'm not sure which way it'll go at this stage. This is a really simple kind of transition for Apple, considering they're already making devices with USB. Can you imagine the hassle, Matt, of trying to transfer files onto an iPhone that's got no port and no cable? Well, Unless they develop lightning fast Bluetooth transfer systems, they're going to be sit there forever. Well, I suspect that what would happen if they went to that stage is a bit like their MagSafe charger now. It charges faster for wireless charging than the standard QI wireless charging. So mm. you would probably get to the point where you'd have some form of wireless transfer device that would transfer faster than having a normal, say, Bluetooth connection, as you suggest. So I think if they go that way, there'll be some sort of proprietary device that will be locked into just Apple devices. Yeah, well, I just thought of what they're going to do. And and Apple, you can send me the, the royalties for this later, but I reckon this wireless charger that you're talking about, Matt, there's going to be a cable out of that that's probably going to be lightning or something that's going to plug into your computer. And when you put your phone on top of it, it's going to allow you to actually transfer files. I've just, I I should be working. That's it. Done. Problem solved. That's that's all you need to do. Thank you, Apple. Just thank me later. Expect a call from Tim Cook any any moment. Yeah. Send this audio and video to Apple. Tim Cook, I've got your solution down pat because I reckon you're already working on it. You don't need USB-C. Just, just make your wireless charger. If you can make power go from there to your phone instantaneously without a cord, I'm sorry, you could transfer a file that way too. That's it, done. Yeah. Problem solved. Not only done. do we talk tech here, you solve problems for the world. I know, right? I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm in the wrong industry here. <laughs> and people are listening to this going, yeah, get out of the industry because we're sick of bloody listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, we all know that we're on to the cryptos, Matt, but apparently China doesn't like them anymore. And this is the advantage and the disadvantage of cryptocurrencies. One of the great advantages they talked about with cryptocurrencies is that no one controls the cryptocurrency. No central yeah. bank, no government controls it. We can be free, free as a bird. But the big advantage is also the big disadvantage when you then get a central bank, i.e. China, who says, uh, you know what, we don't like cryptocurrencies. That's it. No more cryptocurrencies in China. Immediately, the price of Bitcoin as one of those major cryptocurrencies dropped by US $2,000 per coin. So the market didn't like the idea of China saying we don't like cryptocurrencies. Now, it's actually been illegal since 2019 to have cryptocurrencies trading in China itself, but there's been foreign exchanges that have been working away in China, and they've kind of been okay with that ish. But then this year, they've said, right, well, you know what? We're not going to let any of those foreign exchanges, and we're not going to let anyone trade. And actually, now, as of right now, we're not going to allow any trading whatsoever, no purchases to be made, no foreign exchanges. That's it. If you use a cryptocurrency in China, it is illegal. And I've been to China, and I reckon if someone in China, a government said to me, this is illegal, I wouldn't do it. So effectively, that's it. No more cryptocurrencies in China. End of story. Let's move on. Unless the central bank in China or the government decides to create their own cryptocurrency, then it would be okay. But at the moment, any of those other cryptocurrencies no longer are able to be used. And I'm not the biggest fan of cryptocurrencies. I do think there's a bit of potential for people to lose a lot of money. And I did read yeah. a story recently about a person who put themselves forward as the crypto queen. She basically came up with this concept of one coin. She went and started delivering presentations, talking about one coin. It was going to be the next Bitcoin. And this is back around 2016. Within about a year, she had, and the, the authorities don't know exactly how much, but anywhere between 4 billion euro to maybe 15 billion euro invested wow. in one coin. The only minor problem was one coin wasn't a cryptocurrency. There was no blockchain that was created for one coin. It was just going into some bank accounts that she created. And then surprise, surprise, you know where the story's going to go. One day she was meant to turn up at a conference to talk about her cryptocurrency. She didn't turn up. They couldn't find yeah. her. And they haven't been able to find her since. So somewhere in the world... This particular person is living. She's been charged in absence by the US government for wire fraud and a whole range of things. 90 years jail is what she's owed. But she's out there living the high life with 15 billion euros of someone else's money, all on the back of a cryptocurrency, supposedly. I, I get that there's fraud and all the rest of it, Matt, but seriously, how can you go into hiding like you, You'd have to go and see, you know, I, I understand there'd be some remote desert island somewhere you'd live on. But you'd have all this money and you couldn't go spend it. Like no. you couldn't even get home delivery, you know what I mean? Click and collect doesn't work if you're, you know, in the middle of the bloody Indian Ocean or something. I'm, like. not, I'm not so sure. She may be living right here in Mudgee at the moment because I reckon with 15 billion euro in your back pocket, you could probably get yeah. someone to create a new identity for you. So you could yeah. sit down, to, down in Market Street in Mudgee and order your food and go and just be part of normal life. And unless someone was really good in identifying your physical looks, and let's face it, for 15 billion euro, you could probably even change your looks a bit. I reckon you oh, could probably yeah. disappear with that kind of money. Oh, oh, absolutely. Actually, you know what, Matt? No, I'm going to come out and say it. With all the nosy so-and-sos around here in Mudgee, no, you'd be picked out in a second. Everyone <laughs> go, who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> okay, let's pick somewhere else. Not Mudgee then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Now, uh, you you being council, you're the former mayor of Dubbo. How, how long did you spend in local councils, Matt? Uh, Twelve years as a local government, five years as mayor. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a long time in politics, I'll tell you. You know, 12, 12 years. But, uh, of course, when you're the mayor of Dubbo, you're in Dubbo, Re Dubbo Regional Council, you know, a lot of work was done at your meetings, wasn't it, Matt? It was done a lot of work done at meetings, but we didn't have Zoom back in those old days. We're talking pre-pandemic. But a New Zealand council has been doing the right thing. They've had their meetings and they record their meetings. They do them via Zoom and then they post them on YouTube. So this one little New Zealand council found that they had 290,000 views of wow. one of their meetings that was put up on YouTube and they couldn't work out what was going on. It was a 
Wiper District Council Finance and Corporate Committee meeting. Normally, if they get a couple of hundred views of one of their meetings, they think, wow, that's really good. We've really engaged the public here in this meeting. What they found, for whatever reason, that this meeting was particularly good at tricking people into thinking that someone was doing some work. So when they investigated <coughs> a bit further, they found that students, employees, all sorts of people everywhere around the world, if they wanted to trick someone, maybe their parents, maybe their boss, into thinking they were working hard, they put up this meeting, which ran for about one hour and 44 minutes, and had it sitting in the background while they went along and just did whatever they wanted to do. Anyone walked into the room, <laughs> oh, sorry, on a Zoom meeting, can't can't talk, can't talk, I'm on this meeting. Yeah. And they'd look at the screen and they'd see these people in there discussing something and all looking very earnest, so they'd leave them alone and off they'd go. So when they found that this was being done as, as such, they thought that, hold on, these people are using this for whatever reason just to trick their employers, trick their parents, whatever it might be. So just one of those fun little uses of one little meeting suddenly being the perfect meeting for that tricking. Yeah, right. There you go. I, I, would, I would have thought it was, you know, someone wasn't wearing pants in it or something like that. You know what I mean? Like It was just a boring, uneventful meeting where they talked about, basically they were talking about coronavirus and the impact on tourism <laughs> in their particular area. So it probably yeah, says the right. word coronavirus a few times. Someone yeah. catches a few pieces of audio as they walk past. Oh, yeah, they said coronavirus, pandemic. Oh, yeah, that must be relevant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I got I to gotta, I gotta do, I gotta do something like that. But I, I already work from home anyway. And, you know, I turn around and my wife and I go, I'm sorry, I'm working. She turns around and goes, whatever, you don't do anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that was funny was one of the people who commented on it said that they're in the US and they've been using it and his wife did pick up at one stage that there was a bit of a funny accent, a Kiwi accent coming through, <laughs> and he just said that there were a few international people on this particular call. It was a really important call. Yeah. So, so yeah, he yeah. got away with it. <laughs> you love that. All right. Now, now, I know when you and I talk, and, and there are some days where I'm not enthused, and you tend to pick on me a lot about that, Matt. <laughs> Never. Like my moods, especially when, you know, you, we answer the phone and you know what there, there's a great video that i watched that steve harvey talks about you know the american comedian matt yeah, yeah and and steve harvey has this video when he was unemployed he went to sell amway and and this guy used to ring him up at five o'clock every morning he go hey steve blah, blah, it's a great day it's gonna be a great day and he's like yeah man i'm asleep and the guy's <laughs> like why are you like that? And every day for a week, this guy rang him up. Hey, Steve, it's going to be at five o'clock on the dot every morning. So Steve Harvey turned around and he said, he said, blow this. He goes, today I'm going to get him. And uh, Steve Harvey was up at five o'clock and sure enough, the phone rang and he picked up the phone and the guy goes, hey, Steve, it's John here. He goes, hey, John, it's Steve. Yeah, no, I'm going to have a great day. And then the guy turns around to him and goes, see, I did that so you'd be ready for the day. You know, you have to be enthused at the day. But now if you're feeling a bit down, your iPhone can tell you how crappy you actually feel. <laughs> well, it is something that this is the, the next sort of level they're working on with iPhones. We know that the health market for our wearables, our watches, our phones is going to be the next big thing. When you're trying to work out what you're going to do next with the smartphone, they take great photos, you can make phone calls on them, you can connect to the internet, ignore sorts of things, but using your smart devices around your body to track your health, to see whether your heart rate's right, to check your ECG, to check blood pressure, all sorts of things, that's the, the next big industry going forward. But moods iPhones aren't able to do it yet, but this is the next thing they've been working on with UCLA in America, basically trying to develop new technology that will take all the information that it knows about you in terms of your using the phone and see whether or not you're in a good mood or not. I mean, maybe it should just talk to you a bit like you say, oh yeah, how are you sure. going today, Matt? Well, you're probably not in a good mood, just listen to your voice. But it tracks yeah. things like facial recognition. It actually tracks things like how many mistakes you make while you're sending off a text or typing an email on your phone. All this information is fed in, and then it can give you a warning that maybe your mood's been a bit bleak. Maybe you're not feeling great. Maybe no, you should really? go. Yep, yep, that's it. Maybe you should go along and talk to someone to make sure that this mood isn't something that's permanent or is going to have more damaging outcomes. So, yeah, I'm not sure that I want to have my watch on my no. phone starting to tell me that I'm in a bad mood. I mean, Manly lost on the weekend. I was in a bad mood when Manly lost on the weekend. I didn't need a phone oh, to tell me that. Manly. 
Oh, I bloody hell, no one cares about Manly. Just, like, that's just a waste of energy if you're sitting there worrying about bloody Manly. Oh, see, I'm in a bad mood now. Tommy, Tommy Turbo won the Dally M. That yeah. should have perked you back up. Yeah, that's right. They did perk me back up a bit, yeah. yeah so yeah. so this yeah. is the sort of thing, but with all this information, we don't realise how much information is being sent through to our phone with all the actions that we take on a daily basis, being able to interpret that and actually come up with our mood as a result of that, that's where the real challenge is. And I suppose one of the challenges when they talk to some psychologists about this is you don't want to get it wrong. You don't want your phone basically picking up various information and then using that to say, oh, Andrew, you're in a bad mood today. Make sure you go and talk to someone about your mental health. And you go, what? I'm fine. Everything's okay. But it's picked up the information from how you've been using your phone to actually interpret that incorrectly. That's probably one of the risks, I suppose, associated with it. Yeah. I was in a good mood until you brought up my mood. <laughs> I was in, in a great a mood, mood, and now you tell me in a bad mood, I'm going to be in a bad mood. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm just going to be in a bad mood now just for the sake of being in a bad mood. And and because we record these chats, mate, you can go on YouTube and see what kind of mood I'm in. Yeah, yeah so, so give, us an angry, give us an angry face now to make sure yeah, that everyone knows you're in a bad face. mood. Yeah, bloody angry face, bar humbug, whatever, yeah. <laughs> There you go. To some people that actually know me, and by me doing that, is actually my good mood. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Mr. iPhone. See if you can work that one out. Yeah, that's why. That's another reason. I don't, I don't want a temperamental bloody phone. That's why I buy an Android. My, <laughs> my phone just allows me on the internet, listen to music, make a phone call or text. That's it. I don't want you, uh, you know, I, I don't want personal relationships with my phone. Bad enough we're going to deal with that with my wife and my dog. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, here's an interesting book. Uh, I'm going to admit, Matt, this is one book I never, I ne- I've, I've never read and I've never had any interest in reading, but The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, people are obsessed with this book over the years. They have been obsessed with it, the whole series of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I must well, admit... there's more than one? Oh, yeah, there's more than one, of course. Yes, yeah, so long. Oh, and thanks for all the fish was the, was the final one in the series. So I must admit, I, I am a bit of a fan, so I do apologise to you up front. But... You're a nerd. I'm just going to say it. You're, you're a nerd. <laughs> well, there's a few concepts that Douglas Adams came up with. One of my favourites was a way to make something invisible. And you turn something invisible by making it someone else's problem. And as soon as it's someone else's problem, everyone looks the other way because that's someone else's problem. So therefore, that thing becomes invisible. Quite a clever bit of commentary on society as well as being quite a funny little concept. One of the things that he had in the ability, obviously, he had to try and work out a way for these people across the universe to be able to communicate with with each other. Why in the one planet where we've got so many languages, why would we have an expectation that you could travel around the galaxy and actually have people talk to each other and understand them? So he had a thing called a babel fish. And the babel fish was something you put in your ear and it would actually eat the language from one person and the excrement that came out of that was a language that you could understand. So just a funny little science fiction idea. And what we're finding now, so many ideas that people come up with in science fiction are now able to be used. I remember Richie Rich comics when we had video phones and now we've got video calls. Dick Tracy had his watch that was a communicator. Now we've got watches on our wrists that we can actually make phone calls with. The Babel fish is something they've talked about a little bit and saying, I wonder whether we can get there soon. Well, now the new Pixel Buds, this is Google's new Pixel Buds, if you connect those to a modern Android phone and then go into translation mode, you can actually have those buds in real time. Everything you say in English can be translated into a language that you choose, Italian, Greek, if you want to go Greek and talk about yeah. that language. And then when the other person talks, it's translated back into English for you. So you can almost have a real-time conversation with someone with a phone in the middle of that conversation, translating everything that's said in real time. Now, it's relying on it understanding what we say in the first place. And we've all seen funny examples when we've said something to our phone, to our computer, and the translation is completely wrong. But assuming that gets better, we could actually have these conversations with people from around the world using our phone as a translator. I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, that's great for me being Greek, Matt, because I've had to be the translator over the years, and mm-hmm. there is nothing worse when people turn around to you. I remember once we were in high school, and I went with a mate of mine, and we were in St. Ives in Sydney, and we walked into a fish and chip shop, and we ordered some dinner. 
And all of a sudden, the people behind the counter were, were, were speaking another language. My mate turned around to me and goes, they're Greek, aren't they? And I turned around and I said, yes. I said, shut up. I said, if they find out we're Greek, we're never getting out of this bloody story. He said, why is that? I said, because they'll start asking me my life story. So shut up, grab your burger, and let's just go. He goes, what are they saying? I said, if you don't shut up, they're going to spit on your burger. <laughs> Well, one of the other things I've found in translation, and I've done some work over the years where I've had to be communicating with people from other countries, and I've had a, a real live person there as a translator. And it concerns yeah. me that two things happen. Sometimes I'll say 20 seconds of whatever I'm trying to communicate, and the translation goes down to two seconds. And you think, yeah. are you sure you got all of that communicated? Or the opposite's the case, when you just have a, a short statement and the translation goes for a minute, and you think, are they saying the guy looks a bit funny? The guy over there wearing the suit looks a bit funny, but I better say what he actually yeah. just said. So you're not quite sure, whereas at least in this, you can actually see on screen, and I've used translators without having the earbuds. I've used translators overseas on my phone where I talk into my phone and then I can see on screen what it's translated or what it's interpreted what I've said in English and then it translates in a different language. A bit clunky to have a conversation that way, but I've used it in restaurants yeah. and taxis, that type of thing. But putting this earbud in means that it's as close as possible to real-time translation. As I talk, it's translating for that language into another language. Yeah, this is coming handy for my wife because my wife is Anglo and I'm, I'm Greek, right? So, but... But my wife has figured out over the years that if any of my relatives or my parents start talking in Greek, it means they don't, one, they don't want her to hear what she's saying. And nine times out of 10, it's about her. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and, and so, you know, this, this, I've been not telling her about this feature because, you know, I already get in enough arguments with my family and my wife, you know, cause this, this will start World War Three. you I know think, what I mean? Like, I think it would be hilarious. I think stick one of these in your ear next time your family's around. No. And then you no. start speaking Greek while she's sitting over in the corner listening to everything they're saying back i think this would be either hilarious or a divorce whichever no yeah it'd be it'd be a divorce my wife knows if i'm already if i break into the greek i'm really really chipped off <laughs> like that's the <laughs> that's that's when the greek comes out in our household and she knows the swear words now and and so i can't even use those anymore as an outburst because even my wife uses the swear words now so <laughs> isn't it funny that of all the words that people learn the swear words are the first one they go to yeah, I know, right? I know. And for everyone out there, it's not funny when you turn around or agree and go, oh, Malaka. We all know what it means. <laughs> <laughs>